and the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Messiah of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and save us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are all under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day, for this time to get to be together, for this time to honor you and worship you and to call you the King of the universe. Help us. Help us to realize that while we are small people on this planet, that you know us by name, you know how many hairs are on our heads, and that you have sent your son, Jesus, to save us and to restore us into relationship with you. Humble us, Lord, and help us to know that you are God and we are not. Speak to us, Lord, the words you would like us to hear today through all the things that happen in worship, through this preaching, through the scripture, through the music, through the prayers, and through Holy Communion today, and through one another. Speak to us, Lord, the words you want us to hear and help us to hear them, whether they are ever spoken aloud or not. Amen. Well, this is Christ the King Sunday. Um, it's also called the Reign of Christ. Not as in reigning precipitation, but the reign of Christ, the rule of Christ, Christ looking over and ruling over all things. And you know, we have some kings in our culture, but most of us do not really identify with having a king, but culturally, we do have some kings that we look to because they have done great things or remarkable things. For example, last month, the king of golf passed away. Who was that? Arnold Palmer. And how about the king of rock and roll? Who would that be? Elvis. <laughs> we have some enthusiastic Elvis people. Long love the king. <laughs> how about the king of pop? Michael Jackson. Very good. Um, and of course, there are other kings. Like I grew up singing that song from the the seventies. Davy, Davy Crockett. How's it go? King of the Thank you, King of the Wild Frontier. <laughs> Roger Miller had a song, King of the Road. You know, these kings, they, they kind of help us identify with our culture, and they, they are superstars in their own rights, and their legacies live on, you know, sometimes 20, 30, 50 years, and they help us kind of uh, um, just enjoy life a little bit more. But with our democracy, we are not that familiar with having a king. Kings are not really the American way because we live in a democracy. We left the King of England, of course, who was King George III. King George III was a young king when the United States left England and the rule of the monarchy. King George was 22 years old when he became the king. And so we think about crowns and kings, and in America, we don't really do kings very well. The American Revolution, of course, was a revolt against the crown. We didn't want to be ruled by England. Whenever you think about kings, there's a lot that goes along with it. There's a lot of power and authority that goes along with being a king. Most kings are not, have not earned this position. 
they have really just inherited that position because of their families. Their families have been in rule, and so they get to rule also. There's a king who passed away just last month in Thailand. Have any of you heard the, the story about King Bumipan from Thailand who ruled for 70 years? Millions of people over the last month have been in mourning over King Bumipan, the longest running monarch in the history of the world, longer than Queen Elizabeth, 63 years. But King Bumipan could not be criticized. If anybody criticized him or wrote anything about him on the internet that was bad, he would be thrown in jail. But the people loved Bumipan, and they have been in a state of mourning. When you're the king, you have a lot of power. You have authority. You have a lot of wealth that comes with it. You have protection. People cannot get to you. You get to live the world, you live your life on your own terms. And that power is far-reaching. Most of these people have not earned it. They just were born into the right family. Millions of people have mourned Booby Pen because they've never known an existence without him. He ruled since 1946. The outpouring of emotion on the news. Millions and millions of people distraught and crying. But when we think about Christ, what it means to be the king of the world as Jesus Christ, Christ did not wear a golden king crown and live in a castle. It's not mentioned in Luke's gospel, but it is mentioned in the other gospels, how Christ was given a crown, but it was a crown of thorns because they mocked him sarcastically. They put an elegant robe on him. Some other texts say purple robe to mock him that he was royalty. What kind of king is this? Save yourself. This is a crown that actually came from the Holy Land. Uh, friends of mine, the Zugby family, gave this to me as a gift. They live in Bethlehem and Jerusalem area. And this is not the actual crown, of course, but it's something similar because of the bramble wood in that, those spiky thorns that are found in bushes around there. I'm gonna pass this around and feel free to take it out and take a look at it. Just a word of caution. Those little spikes and spiny things are quite sharp. So I'll pass this around throughout the service. What kind of crown wears, what kind of king wears a crown of thorns? The kings in this world are usually quite royal. A lot of them are elderly because they have been in power for a long time, and most of them really like being in positions of power. They get to observe the world from their high perch. It's more of a top-down kind of authority. Very different from the crown that Christ wore as our Lord and Savior. today, we are talking about what kind of king Jesus is. They have identified him as king of the Jews and put that sign above his head. The Roman Empire and the rule of Caesar was a strong rule, and anyone who challenged that authority was crushed. The crucifixions that happened in that day were done front and center. 
They were done along roadsides. They were done hundreds a day at different times in history because they wanted people to see what happens to people who challenge the rule and the authority of Caesar. The Roman Empire lasted for over 500 years. Jesus was made fun of. He was mocked. He was mocked by the soldiers. He was mocked by the other one of the fellows on the cross. He was mocked by the authorities. Luke's Gospel says that the people who were there just watched. Criminal, one criminal is hurling insults at Jesus. What's the difference between the one on his right and the one on his left that one of them could recognize who he was? The one said, hey, he has done nothing wrong. We're getting what we deserve. These guys were bandits. They had been tried and had been convicted of probably pretty serious crimes. But the one said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Somehow through the blood and the sweat and the tears and the pain of that horrible Friday afternoon, he could see that Christ was a king. Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. What kind of king is Jesus? Well, he's the opposite of a worldly king, of a power-hungry, power-grabbing kind of authority, one who seizes privileges at every turn. In fact, Jesus turns the whole world upside down through his crucifixion. He turns the world upside down. He turns the whole idea of what it means to be a leader in the world. And he's got a different, he's got a different kind of a rule. Can you see it? It's a rule not of power and of being in charge. It's a rule of grace, of the goodness of God coming through Christ, who was willing to go to the cross. Grace is a word that we use a lot in the Lutheran Church. It's from Martin Luther's founding principles. We are saved by grace through faith. Not by works can anyone boast. And what is grace? Grace is God's goodness given to you freely as a gift. Not because you've been good enough or because of anything you have done or not done. You cannot do enough. And you don't need to do anything because it's a gift from God that has been earned through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Jesus turned the powers of the world upside down. He was not the top-down kind of a leader. He was a servant leader, one who washed the feet of his disciples, one who fed the hungry, one who touched the untouchables, one who ate the sinners and tax collectors. Anglican Bishop N.T. Wright from England recently released a new book called The Day the Revolution Began. The day the revolution began was Christ's crucifixion day. It wasn't the day that Bernie Sanders said there's going to be a revolution. <laughs> N.T. Wright says the day that Christ was crucified was the day the revolution began because the cross ended an era and began a whole new era, the reign of Christ. You want to know about the reign of Christ? Read the Gospels you'll hear all about the kind of life that Christ has died to give us. One of healing and wholeness and inclusion and love and forgiveness. And Christ is like a bridge. Can you see this bridge here? It kind of looks like maybe the Stone Arch Bridge. Christ is the bridge. Christ is the bridge that, go, that spans the distance between us and God. Christ is the way that we have access to God. God's gifts come to us through Jesus. And without it, without Christ, we would not have that connection. And Christ's death, N.T. Wright says, was really not only about forgiveness of sins and life and salvation, but it's also about freeing you to know that you can go out into the world and live a life of vocation, to live a life of service, loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. Do any of you work in downtown Minneapolis? See that skyline? Do you see it? Maybe some of you work in the city, maybe some of you work outside the city and can see it. But N.T. Wright says that the crucifixion 
frees us to live a life of vocation, a life of reconciliation, a life of love and peace for the sake of the world. This is, this is God's kingdom. This is the reign of Christ. This is Christ the King's world. Kingdoms have come and kingdoms have gone, just as presidential candidates come and they go. The Roman Empire lasted 500 years, the Ottoman Empire 600 years, but every empire on this earth passes away. In a few moments, we will be confessing our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed, and they can be found on page four of your bulletin. And when we get to those three articles, we first talk about God, then Jesus, then the Holy Spirit. The second section, the very last line of the Nicene Creed, talks about Jesus and his kingdom. On page four, at the end of that second paragraph, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And I want to just encourage you to be ready to say these words, and his kingdom will have no end. Are you ready? Let's practice. And his kingdom will have no end. This is a kingdom that is here and now ushered in by Jesus Christ's own death on the cross. It has eternal consequences. It frees you to love and serve and to live an abundant life of love and service to the neighbor because of what Christ has done. Amen.